Hello everyone. Uh, so today we're going to go in a little bit more deeply into the history of sociology. So a little bit more of the background information of what we've been looking at and a little bit more on what exactly sociology might look like in practice. And also today we're going to cover a few main ideas that we'll be looking at throughout the whole term, uh, including uh, different theories, theories, uh, different theories, and the concept of power. So we're looking at these main ideas throughout uh, this term, and in particular, we'll get started with this um, section here. So um, one of the main things we want to take a look at, as I mentioned, power is one of the main concepts we've noticed in uh, what we'll be talking about in sociology. Uh, it's one of the main concerns of sociologists. So power, as far as we'll be talking about here, defines the relationship, the motivation, and the outcome for the practice of sociology. It also plays a key point when we're talking about power uh, in, in some of the theories we'll be looking at. So um, here's the two main ideas that we'll be looking at. So as we talked about before sociology, I see it as two uh, separate aspects that are separate but related. Understanding society and transforming society. So as we said before, these things aren't necessarily separate from each other. They are always related with each other, um, but some sociologists choose to do one over the other. So we're always thinking about understanding society or think about transforming society. And one of the main things that divides these two, as we see here, is this concept of power. So power throughout is, depending on how a person is interested in dealing with power, is gonna be which direction they tend toward, whether they're transforming society or understanding society. So a little more deeply what we're talking about here then. So one of the main ideas then is one of the histories then of sociology is uh, this, this box right here between colonization and securing power. So one of the first sociologists was really using sociology to better understand society, but it was for the idea of securing power, not necessarily making the place better for everybody, make it easier to um, control people. So what are the two main ideas that use this is uh, maybe the state, like um, state research projects, uh, sometimes academic research projects, but some two, I think, um, big groups that maybe will get, make this clearest two examples would be the early colonists and especially the English uh, in, the, in India. So early English colonists, they actually would be early sociologists um, before they're actually called sociologists and they went into India to better understand um, the the people there understand their political structure their economic structure and their social structure in order to better control the, the folks there so the early sociologists in this context weren't necessarily interested in making the world a better place they were more interested in how can we best control this new colony we've taken over with military force. So rather than having to keep the military around, if we understand their political structure, their economic structure, and their social structure, we can make laws, policies, and regulations that'll help best control the folks here. So this is the idea of securing power as one of the ways that uh, understanding society was used for. So the idea of power in this sense was trying to bring power towards the center. We can move over a little bit. So power is here idea of bringing all the power to itself, early sociologists. Whereas the other version of it is the opposite view of power. So power is coming inward. On this view, um, other sociologists are interested in taking power like this and spreading it out. I'm going to give power out to other people. And so this idea then is rather than trying to um, rather than trying to secure power, these folks are interested in dispersing power, spreading it out. So the goal is transforming society, as we set up here, uh, through liberation, dispersing power. So some of the examples from these are revolutionary groups uh, or community groups that particularly focus on the local, I'll highlight local here. So any of these groups focusing on people like in their neighborhood, people in their local community, uh, in order to better understand what's going on there so they could help disperse power and spread it out. So one of the early folks that we'll be talking about a lot here is a man named Paulo Freire. 
So he was an educator in Brazil in the 1960s and 70s. And what he observed is he saw that in society, this idea of having a democratic society where everyone is represented didn't seem to be equal with the way we have our education system. The de democratic society was not equal education, meaning that in where we have education now, there is always a teacher up in the front of the classroom and the teacher is always more important than the student. So if education currently looks like this, where one person is more important than the other person, that's why he's saying it's not equal to a democracy. So he was interested then in saying, how do we imagine a society where the teachers are equal to the students? Where the teachers are equal to the students. And this would be a better way to get to a democratic society. So his whole idea then, much like other sociologists in this vein, was how do you take power then and give it out to more people? So one of his main things that he did was rethink education systems. And rather than having a one size fits all approach, he went into local groups, uh, local communities, for example, and saw what was interesting to them, what was important to that group, and built up the classroom time, the assignments and the curriculum based on what they were interested in. So one of his main campaigns, a good example of this, is trying to make a literacy campaign because a lot of folks in Brazil at that time did not have um, a high literacy rate, meaning that a lot of folks didn't know how to read and write, about only 30% knew. And with his campaign, he was trying to increase that percentage. So often when a frere would go into a community, he'd start off with local movements, see what they were interested in. And then he was able to make curriculum and actually able in about five or six months, able to bring the people's literacy up in any community that he went to and gave them tools so they could maintain that. Um, whatever the groups you might think of would be um, Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the Black Panthers from the 1960s and 70s, taking local interests and needs and working to transform society. So overall, this whole idea then of power is central. So whether you are transforming society or you are trying to uh, maintain it or just understand it. So there are different ways that sociologists do this. And understanding and transforming, like I said before, are always related with each other. They're not separate. So for instance, a person wanting to transform society, well, we need to better understand it first. So going down this way. Uh, so the major theories in sociology all take um, one version or the other of this. Um, and whether understanding society or trying to transform it. Um, they always take a little bit of both, of course, um, but they're going to go through and see which works best for them to do their research, do their work in the community. So just an important point here, all of the major sociological theories have the possibility of being either liberatory or maintaining power. So like we saw above, the idea of making things better for people or also keeping control. So they could be either one. I would argue that um, some of these views are a little bit better at transforming than others, while some of them are a little bit better at looking at how keeping things the same. So while they could do both, some are just a little bit more suited for that. I'll show you what I mean. So there's three main theories we'll be looking at now and throughout the term. So the first one is called functionalism. A lot of what you could see in a lot of these names is just pay attention to the name. You could see here function is one of the first ideas. So this idea of functionalism is looking for the function of how society um, works as a whole. So how society functions. So quite literally, one of the early guys uh, we'll talk about a lot is uh, Durkheim, Emil Durkheim. And he was really seeing how, um, he was looking for a formula that makes society work. So he literally thought that you could take um, things like a math formula and figure out how to make society work. So for instance, if you were um, if you were looking at uh, poverty, for instance, in the United States, trying to see, okay, so poverty is here and homelessness is here. Uh, maybe we could find the solution here. So really, any problem he thought, if you were new one, if you knew parts of it, you could come up with a solution at the end. So his goal was to figure out what made society tick, like a machine or like a body. So really interested in looking what makes society function as though it were a formula and assuming that all things work together. So
So um, we'll go look at this real quick. You see uh, my excellent artwork here. This is supposed to be a, uh, a human body. So you see here we got the head, the hands, and the foot. So a functionalist then imagines society as being the whole human body working together. So in our example here, we have the head, hand, and foot. So in a society, all these pieces work together. Like you can't have this sociological body working with all these pieces, but still we know um, biologically, you know, biological theory, that we tend to think of some of these as more important than others. We tend to think of the head as the most important, hand and foot as less important. So for instance, in a society imagined as a body, the head might be the executive or the president, the executive of a business or president of a country, hand might be something like a teacher or professional, where the foot, the worker who gets everything done is at, is at the bottom of society. So imagining then that society is this whole, a sociologist from this perspective would be interested in seeing how uh, these things work together, the head, the hand, and the foot to make society work. So the functionalist is always assuming that everything has its place. Um, for instance, if we're thinking of education and schooling, if you're to say, what role does education have in society? You might see that it serves the, um, function, the function in society of educating people to get ready for jobs. So education serves the function of jobs. Um, and it, within that school, there is the, the teacher, maybe the principal, and then the student. But you could always see that some are more important than others, right? There's a, a, a influx understanding of higher values here. So one of the ways that this is applied, for instance, is then it, not only does that mean that are we interested in looking how things function, but we also think of society as being more important than just the individual. Uh, so this is different from before at the time when Durkheim was writing, people were largely thinking about um, psychology or the individual. With the society as a whole, you start thinking about how the individual fits within that larger picture. So in, 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 uh, in this view then, society becomes more important than just the individual. So, and, and then both of these always work together. Society and, and the individual work together. And when the individual then feels like they're separated, feels like they're separated from society, they feel separated from society, then uh, a person starts to feel um, badly. This idea of alienation. And we can think of that in our own personal lives when you've ever been separated from people or maybe quarantined or isolated, you start to feel as though um, you're not your best self. So this feeling uh, that Durkheim would describe the feeling of alienation when the individual no longer feels a part of the whole. So one of his major works that Durkheim looked at then was a, it was the topic of suicide, exploring this idea of alienation, that he looked specifically at groups that thought um, that had lower suicide rates he saw uh, actually had stronger bonds. So groups that people that tended to get together more, had more Sunday picnics, uh, church gatherings, things like that, they were less likely to commit suicide because they were not feeling this thing of alienation. So the topic for Durkheim then was that individuals are stronger when they're together. So like a body or like a machine, society functions as a whole. So people using this perspective of functionalism, that it's really good for understanding how things stay the same or how things function or work. So if you're interested in the education system, if you're interested in the political system, um, a functionalist would be interested in how these things work together and how they work as a whole. So if it's, under, it's interested in seeing how things stay the same, what it's not good for then is looking at how ideas change. This perspective is not good at looking at how things change over time because it assumes that like a body, everything's running together, working together. So if then if functionalism, the first one was looking at how things stay the same, our second one here, conflict theory, would be looking at how things are different things change over time. So with this perspective, and again, we could look at the name here, conflict theory, it's really important to see how things work together and how they maybe oppose each other. 
So the two main words here that if you need to know anything from uh, conflict theory, you want to know relationship and again, power. So essentially, any um, conflict theorist is going to be looking at the relationship between two or more groups and seeing how power works there. So one of the, the easiest ones maybe would be looking at the second one here, ruling class versus working class. So the example I like to give here is if you've ever worked a job, we think of things like the boss is always up above the worker. So as far as their concerns are, the boss is always interested in keeping wages low, while the worker wants to keep wages high. A boss wants to keep wages low because the lower the wages are, the more money they could keep for themselves and make a profit, which in our society is important for reinvesting into a business to make more money. Uh, the worker, however, wants to say, of course, if you've ever worked for wages, you want to make wages as high as possible because you need to pay for things like rent. So the idea then, the relationship between these two concepts, between boss and worker, is to end up causing a conflict. So here's the conflict that we're talking about. So the relationship is causing conflict. And this conflict between these two groups ends up producing change. So theorists within this group will want to see how this conflict results in change and what that change might look like. So you can really use this in any sort of relationship. I have several more over here. So one of them, any group where there's a difference in power. So a teacher and a student, how their conflict might uh, result in change, a parent or a child. Uh, Freire was interested in looking at oppressor versus oppressed. So basically any spot where you can find power differences between people, uh, you can look at that relationship and start seeing how things will change. So one of the main people in this uh, is Marx, and this goes right here with this boss versus worker idea. So essentially what Marx was doing and kind of founded the idea of conflict theory was looking at the conflict between two groups, in this case boss versus worker, and so how this changed society. This relationship propels modern society forward. So this, race, this uh, particular view is really good for uh, understanding how things change because that's exactly what it's concerned with. Uh, this perspective is built on the idea that things are continually changing. So this one's good for change, its interest in society as a whole, and seeing how all the little pieces within it can change over time and make something new. So going into the third one then. So both these first two, functionalism and conflict theory, we're both interested in looking at society as a whole. So society as a whole and how the overall society affected all even the little individuals within it. This third and final perspective then is taking the opposite view. So interaction in, interactionism or interactionist theory is rather than looking at the big picture of things, it's interested in how individuals working or interacting interacting with each other, change society. So the image I like to do with this one, before we go into more detail, again, my uh, artwork here, uh, these are two individuals down here on both sides, and basically interaction, interactionism is looking at how the interaction between these two people, and this is the spot that they're interested in right here in the middle, how their interaction in between each other actually will go up and create society. So at the smallest level, they're looking at two individuals, one and two, seeing how that interaction in this very center spot here creates society itself. So rather than seeing something as coming from society down, social interactionism is looking at what happens at the bottom and up. So quite literally, this little interaction right here actually creates society. So quite literally they mean our daily interactions actually create reality. Just a quick example here. So let's say let's say here uh, person A and person B. So for instance, uh, imagine person A and person B are in a relationship. And person A here thinks that person B is being unfaithful or is cheating on him. So in, in an interactionist perspective, we're not so interested necessarily whether person B is being unfaithful. But what ends up happening here is when these two are interacting with each other, person A with person B, it actually creates a new reality. 
So reality itself, society itself, can be affected by the relationship. And if you've ever experienced this before, or know one of people that experienced this before, this idea is that if one person no longer trusts the other person, this can change the relationship itself. The reality for these people is different, and it doesn't even matter whether person B is being unfaithful or not. So in case the, the real, the quote-unquote real, doesn't matter in this perspective as much as perception or how people see things. So real doesn't matter, it's more about perception. Okay, so let's go back up and we'll see what this means. So the individual is literally creating society. We'll scroll up a little bit here. So we go back to the beginning. Um, if the first two look at the big picture, this one looks at the individuals. So literally then symbols are important in this perspective that symbols actually make reality. And we talked about that down there where the uh, perception of one person about the other actually changes how they understand their partner, how they understand society, right? And finally, the, in this perspective also means because we're focusing on the individual, we're also interested in subjectivity or the person's experience. Because the first two, conflict theory and functionalism, don't really care too much about what the individual thinks because it's society that changes things or keeps things the same. From this one, it's the individual subjective experience that matters. So because of this, it makes society changeable and dynamic, and it makes it really good for, section down here, makes it really good for understanding um, things like media or uh, social media, art, and uh, TV and music, because these things, quite literally from this perspective, music, media, film, social media, even though they're not real, even though these things are not real, they can have real consequences. So though this isn't real, it can have real consequences. So a song, a movie, a film, these things don't actually exist in reality, but they can have consequences if enough people start to believe that they're real. They have real consequences. Scroll down here then. This perspective is really good then. If you are ever interested in doing one of your research projects or papers on uh, media, social media posts, or YouTube uh, experience, these things actually can help create society and change how things actually exist. So again, these three, we'll be going over them throughout the term. Um, and it's helpful to remember just looking at their name, what sort of thing they focus on. Interactionism focuses on interaction between people. Conflict theory focuses on conflict over power and relationships. Whereas functionalism is finally looking at how things function in society, looking at it like a body or a machine.